Okay, so welcome to the next lecture for A&P 1105A. This is lecture 18 about the lymphatic system. Okay, so this is a bit of departure from what we've been talking about recently. Um, and the upload date for this is going to be November 18th, 2020. Okay, uh, so what are we talking about today? Well, last time we left off and we were talking about um, how when we're at the capillaries, there's fluid that flows out of the capillaries at the venous end. And uh, a lot of that fluid comes back in at the capillary end, but not all of it goes back in. There's some fluid that remains in the interstitial space. And if you remember, the interstitial space is this space between the, uh, the two different types of cells. So the cells with, that make up your blood vessels and the cells that might make up the muscles, for example. Uh, and so it's the job of the lymphatic system to pick up this fluid and uh, bring it back to your blood supply into the uh, venous system, okay? Um, and so there's this large network of what are called lymphatic capillaries and lymphatic ducts um, that, that bring this interstitial fluid back to the venous system. And as we'll see, the lymphatic system is also important for your immune response. So really, it, it has those two main functions. Okay, so what are we gonna learn to do today? This is, again, kind of a departure from what we've been doing. Um, we're really just gonna to touch on, on the main aspects of the lymphatic system. Again, there's people that kind of study this for their entire lives. Uh, we're just gonna really kind of touch the surface here. So it's all about looking at uh, the main concepts of structure and function, and, and really looking at, at this component of the system that's referred to as lymph and how it's transported within the system. Uh, there's a relevant text here is chapter 20. It's a very short chapter. Um, we're not going to be dealing with chapter 21. So there's some concepts that are, are dealt with both in chapter 20 and 21. Uh, chapter 21 is a, a more in-depth immunology. And this is information that you'll deal with in, in later courses, uh, even in third or fourth year on its own. Okay. Um, so I've also indicated uh, some of the key tables and figures here that you should take a look at and know a little bit better than some of the others. Um, and as usual, I've indicated a, uh, an external web resource that I think that you guys might find useful. Um, okay, so uh, first of all, we're going to start off and do a short video. And this is a video from the textbook that will help to, to put in perspective why the lymphatic system is important uh, in your body and why it's important for infection control. Okay, so we're just going to play this. Did you know that the body contains hundreds of bean-sized organs that are critical to fighting off infections? These organs are the lymph nodes, which are the principal lymphoid organs of the body. Lymphoid organs work in conjunction with the lymphatic system to provide a structural basis for your body's immune system. As a healthcare professional, it's critical that you understand the structure and function of the lymph nodes so that you can properly check for signs of infection in your patients. During infection, the lymph nodes, which are usually unnoticeable, will become swollen and tender and are easily felt or palpated on the patient's body, especially in the neck region. A solid understanding of the anatomy and physiology of the lymph nodes and other lymphoid organs will enable you to properly evaluate your patients for signs of infection. Okay, and so that's what we're dealing with in this, in this chapter, in this lecture, is the lymphatic system. Lymphatic system is both recycling or returning uh, interstitial fluid back to the venous system, and it is also involved in um, in infection control in your body. And so that's what what really we really think of as, as the most important clinical function. So um, just so, some some basic definitions here. The lymphatic system, what is it? This, again, I just kind of said this, returns fluids that are leaked from blood vessels. And we know that this occurs in the capillary system. And this is brought back to the blood, okay? Um, and it consists of three parts. You have the lymphatic vessels themselves, okay? Uh, the lymph, the lymph is the actual fluid that is within those vessels, and something called lymph nodes. Um, and there's lymph nodes we're going to talk about in more detail, but one of the main jobs of the lymph nodes is to clean the lymph, okay? So, so get rid of uh, any, any unwanted debris, uh, viruses, bacteria, these types of things. This third function is also supported by lymphoid organs and tissues. Um, some of these are structural in nature, some of these are functional in nature, um, but the main job of these is to provide a space for uh, your lymph, again, derived from blood, to, uh, to 
uh, interact with cells from your immune system that can detect bacteria, viruses, these types of things. And so as we go through this lecture, we're going to talk about all these different structures very briefly, just a short introduction in each case. So spleen, thymus, tonsils, lymph nodes, and there's also a variety of other lymphoid tissues as well. Okay, so what does the lymphatic system do? As I said, uh, as you push out about uh, 20 liters of interstitial fluid uh, a day, about 17 of it is brought back on the venous end. So again, last lecture we talked about fluid getting pushed out on the arterial end, and then it's going to go back in, in the, um, on the venous end of the capillary bed. Interwoven amongst this capillary bed are these lymphatic vessels, and it's the job of those lymphatic vessels to pick up any fluid that doesn't make it back into the venous system. And so generally this is about three liters per day, so actually quite a lot. Once that fluid uh, enters uh, the lymphatic system, we refer to it as lymph. So it goes from being blood to interstitial fluid, and then once it goes into these green vessels here, that's by definition when we refer to it as lymph. Okay, but initially it's fluid, mostly water, uh, uh, originally derived from blood plasma, um, that, that's coming from the blood. Okay, um, so what are our uh, lymphatic capillaries? These are these things that are, are, are again wrapped around this uh, capillary bed here. So blood's going to be coming in this side, you're going to have fluid that moves out of the capillary bed, and you're going to have fluid that comes back in on this side and then the blood is going to be moving out of the capillary bed. Okay, and this is the same directionality that we've talked about quite a bit. Uh, the lymphatic vessels are a little bit different than the blood flow, and this is because it's really only a one-way flow. It's not a circuit, it's just going back to the venous system, okay? Um, and so, uh, again, one of the, the main features of this are these lymphatic capillaries. They're interwoven amongst these uh, capillary beds. You have them basically all over your body. Um, they are absent from the bone and the teeth. Used to be the case that people thought that they weren't found in the nervous system, but more recently we think that there are lymphatics in the nervous system as well. Okay, um, lymphatic capillaries. Again, so I've been showing the same diagram a few times. These are these guys that are interwoven amongst the capillary beds, and it's their job to take up things that, that uh, blood capillaries might not be able to, um, things like uh, large proteins, cellular debris, pathogens, uh, cancer cells, these types of things. And it's okay if they take those up because, as I said, these lymphatic capillaries, these are going to intersect with your immune system. So all those things are going to be taken care of. Okay. So the other side of that is if your immune system is not working properly, the lymphatic system can actually serve as a route for pathogens such as bacteria or even cancer cells to travel throughout your entire body. Uh, lymphatic capillaries, uh, the, the word capillaries basically indicates that these are small vessels, um, but there's a few features that differentiate them from the capillaries we associated with blood travel throughout the body. Uh, well, first of all, I mentioned, and it's not really listed here, is that uh, the lymph is not going through a circuit, it's just going in one direction from the interstitial fluid back up to, to uh, the venous system. And we'll talk about where it enters the venous system in a few slides. Uh, these lymphatic capillaries have a few uh, unique features. Uh, first of all, uh, they are, are called blind-ended. So, so again, there's no circuit. They just kind of end, okay? Because they just have to pick up fluid from here, goes in here, and then it's off to, to be joined up with the venous system. And again, we're going to get to that. Um, so how do these guys work? Uh, well, they have what are called these mini valves. And the basic idea is that uh, much like the capillaries, these cells are not, uh, the, the endothelial cells are not uh, very tightly joined together. And in fact, in the case of the lymphatic capillaries, they actually overlap with one another. So they go kind of like this, not like this, like this. And one of those is anchored to the wall. So you might have this upper one here. Uh, anchored to, to, to the surrounding tissue, the connective tissue. And so what happens is once pressure builds up here, for example, this flap is going to get pushed forward and fluid can basically flow in. So just like this, okay? There's a gap that forms and fluid can flow into the capillary beds. So that's what happens when that three liters of fluid is pushed out into the system. 
the, uh, the pressure outside of these mini valves will increase, the valves will open, and fluid will enter into this lymphatic capillary. Again, it's blind-ended because there's no circuit. Uh, so, so these uh, uh, capillaries, like the blood supply, are going to join up to form larger and larger uh, uh, structures, larger and larger vessels. Okay, um, And so uh, these uh, uh, collecting vessels are called trunks and, and ducts. So basically these are, are reflecting larger and larger structures. It goes node, trunk, duct, and then this is returned back to the venous system. And so this diagram shows it well here. The, the lymph is picked up here and it's brought up through this system. As it's going through the system, there's chance for the uh, lymph to be uh, screened by your immune system to remove things like viruses and bacteria, uh, other debris, um, toxins, and then it, it is emptied back to the venous system. Okay, um, These larger lymphatic vessels here, the ducts and trunks, things like this, um, they have uh, structures that are, that are similar to, to, uh, to veins, really. Uh, they do have thinner walls, but they also have these kind of internal valves. Why do they need those internal valves? Uh, they need it because uh, this is a very low pressure system. And just as we saw with the veins, when you have a low pressure system, those valves will help to, to keep the, the fluid flowing in one direction. Okay, and, and problems can occur when that doesn't actually happen. Uh, one example of this problem is uh, something called lymphangitis. Um, and so this is a situation where these lymph vessels become inflamed. Okay, and so you might see this as kind of a, a inflammation across your arm like this in this example. Okay, and uh, this is actually occurring uh, because the lymph nodes uh, that are so the lymph uh, flowing through what are called the vasa basora of, of large blood vessels become uh, congested or inflamed or infected. Okay, now you might be wondering what are vasa basora? You might have heard that before. Well, yes, we talked about this when we we're talking about the structures of the arteries and the veins. When you have something like a myocardium in these large arteries or veins. Uh, you have, they have their own supply of, of blood. And so that's brought by smaller arteries and picked up by smaller veins. Okay, and so this is conceptually similar to the coronary artery uh, and vein system that provides the myocardium of the heart, the, the, the blood supply and removes waste. But at the time, I also pointed out that there's, so you have a red dot here for the artery, the small arteries which feed the myocardium. A blue dot represents the veins. Same over here, red and blue. Um, but you also have these yellow ones. These yellow ones are representing uh, the, the, the lymphatic system. So uh, just like other tissues, there are interstitial spaces in here. There's fluid that's pushed out and, and these guys have to, to, to be drained of that interstitial fluid. Um, and so these guys have their own uh, supply of lymphatic vessels as well. And what we saw in that previous slide is that those can become infected uh, or blocked, and that's what we see with that condition on the previous slide, where we have on that patient's arm, uh, basically a red stripe down the arm, okay? So that's a sign of that inflammation. That's also uh, physiologically uh, represents the fact that you have those vasa basora that are lymphatics that are invading the uh, muscle layer of those arteries or veins. So uh, the broader lymphatic system, again, you're going to have uh, these uh, lymphatic capillaries that they're going to drain into larger and larger vessels until eventually it, it's returned to your venous system. And where these enter into your venous system are on two spots. It's either on the right, again we're looking at the patient, so we're defining this as the right side and this is the left side, always from the patient perspective. And uh, so you have this area which is drained uh, into a, a duct draining draining um, in this side of the body, so uh, into your uh, vein right underneath your, your bone here called the clavicle. And then on the other side, on the left side, you're, you're actually draining a much larger area. So basically the entire rest of the body is going into the right side again under the, under the bone called the clavicle. Okay, And so you have the right lymphatic duct, that's one over here, and then you have the thoracic duct, and this is the one over on this side. Okay, so again, the theme here is that you're picking up fluid uh, from interstitial spaces all over your body, including 
large arteries and veins. And this is being uh, brought up to your entire body, um, throughout your entire body, bigger and bigger vessels until eventually it joins up with your venous system. So the blood is filtered, or sorry, the lymph, I should say, is filtered and cleaned, and then it's returned to the venous system, and it adds to, to the blood volume within the venous system, okay? Uh, so uh, if you recall, uh, veins are, are under a low pressure system, and so we have all these uh, adaptations for veins that allow them to work, and I've already hinted that these also exist for the uh, lymphatic system as well, which is also a low pressure system. Okay. And so uh, to get lymph to move through lymph vessels, again, you have a lot of the same adaptations. And so we talked about this one previously, the milking action of skeletal muscle. What does that mean? It basically means that as you're moving, as you're active, your muscles will contract and relax, and that will push on the veins, or in this case, the lymphatic system, and move the lymph through the system. Um, we also before talked about how movement through the venous system is also facilitated by changes in uh, uh, the thorax that occurs during breathing. And again, we're going to talk about breathing in the next unit. Uh, I already mentioned this. There's valves in the lymphatic system to, to prevent backflow. These are, are very similar to the, to the again, to the semilunar valves that you have in your heart. Again, I mentioned that the basically uh, the, the lymph, uh, or in the cases of the veins or the heart, you have uh, the blood is basically going to go through these semi-lunar valves, much like kind of the cowboy busting into the saloon. Um, and then, of course, if the blood tries to flow back, it's going to catch these cusps here, and it's not going to be able to go back in the other direction. So you have all these things, the, the skeletal muscle, the, the, the breathing um, that's propelling the lymph in a, a certain direction, and then the valves are going to prevent backflow. Um, there's also um, uh, contractions of, of smooth muscle that will help to, to propel lymph in the correct direction. And this one's interesting, the pulse, pulsations of nearby arteries. So often these, these lymph vessels will uh, travel with arteries. Um, in fact, we saw an example of that where, when we had this uh, in, in, uh, inflammation in the arm. Um, and uh, kind of the contraction and relaxation of the arteries will also help to propel um, the lymph through the system. So again, the idea here is that you're picking up this interstitial fluid, it's under very low pressure down in the capillaries, but you have to get it back up to the neck because that's where it's gonna rejoin with the rest of your blood. And so in this scenario, uh, the low pressure is not able to move it very fast. And so uh, there's all these adaptations that allow it to move in a single direction, okay? Well, what happens if it's not moving in a single direction? You can get something called lymphedema. Lymphedema is where you cannot adequately turn uh, the lymph up towards your, your, your neck region under the clavicle here. Um, and this can occur if those lymph vessels are blocked, could occur because they are, are uh, blocked by a tumor, for example. Maybe they're removed because of some sort of a surgery. Um, and often you can get uh, some of the other vessels will, will adapt um, they can enlarge and, and you'll eventually be able to get that drain that drainage. But if you, you see a patient that has something like this, this is a, a very clear sign that there is something uh, wrong with the lymphatic system. Okay. Um, so this is all that was all about fluid return. So it's about picking up that interstitial fluid, uh, that three liters that doesn't make it back into the venous end of the capillary. And it's returning this uh, to the venous system. Uh, elsewhere in the body. But first, uh, the blood is going to be, er, the, the lymph, sorry, it's always lymph when we're talking about the lymphatic system. It's going to be uh, filtered and cleaned, okay? Because we don't want any type of bacteria, toxins, viruses, these types of things in there. And so the lymphatic system at its heart is also a, a, a uh, immune organ, okay? Um, and so uh, you have these different types of immune cells that basically protect you from, again, things like viruses or bacteria. So you have different types of cells such as T cells and B cells. So these are T lymphocytes and B lymphocytes. And then you have macrophages and dendritic cells. And these are basically the partners of these guys. And we'll look very briefly at how that partnership works. You also have reticular cells. Uh, these are basically making a mesh-like uh, fiber um, called a stroma. 
And these are, this is found in various lymphoid organs. Again, we're going to talk about a number of lymphoid organs. Um, and this provides a scaffold where all of these different types of cells, the T cells, B cells, macrophages, and dendritic cells can interact together to do what they need to do in order to, to filter and clean your blood. Now, the action of these guys is actually pretty complex. Uh, there's an entire chapter uh, uh, dedicated to, to the action of B and T cells and other types of immune cells, uh, but we're not going to be looking at chapter one. We're just taking really kind of a cursory overview here in chapter 20. And indeed, if you go on uh, to study this type of stuff in, in higher years of school, uh, you'll see that there's entire courses dedicated to, to these different types of cells, how they're regulated, and in some cases, how we can actually use them to fight various diseases such as cancer. So let's look first at B and T cells. Uh, these guys protect against what are called antigens. What is an antigen? It's basically a thing that is recognized by B or T cells. Um, and this could be anything that the body perceives as foreign. So it might be a bacteria, a toxin, viruses, could be a defective cell type, or even a cancer cell. Um, T cells are really all about attacking uh, invaders that are inside of cells. Okay, so what these will do is that these will sense that something is wrong with the cell, that it is infected, and these will cause the cell to be, to be segregated and, and, and often killed. Uh, B cells, however, uh, these will produce ultimately what are called plasma cells. Plasma cells secrete antibodies. So that's what's, uh, uh, um, I think, supposedly represented here, uh, this antibody structure. Antibodies will... will interact with these bacteria and these viruses and that actually marks them for degradation by the partners in crime for B and T cells. These are the, uh, the macrophages, for example, okay? Um, and they will destroy them by, by phagocytosis or other means. Uh, so macrophages, again, they're going to, to uh, uh, help trap those foreign substrates. They're going to activate T cells as well. And dendritic cells are going to uh, uh, capture antigens and they're going to deliver them to specialized parts in the body where all of this, all of these interactions can occur. And these will also help to activate T cells. Again, this is a little light on details and it's because it gets quite complicated. There's entire chapters uh, dedicated to, to all of this um, that we're not going to touch on. Okay. Uh, so lymphoid tissue, we've been using this, this term kind of off and on here. Lymphoid tissue makes up a, a bunch of, of different uh, 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 organs within your lymphatic system. Um, and there, there's different types of this tissue. Um, but the basic idea is that these reticular connective tissues will form this type of network or scaffold. So that's shown here. So look at these kind of fibers here. And that's where B and T cells and various lymphocytes can interact with each other. They can uh, screen the blood and they can get rid of any debris such as bacteria, viruses, or toxins. Okay. Um, the, the other um, thing is that there's a lot of space between these fibers and this basically offers a place for those cells to, to hang out and wait for, for anything like these various antigens to come through in the body. Okay. Um, there's two main types of lymphoid tissues. Um, or categories, I suppose. It can be very diffuse, um, and you see this in some tissues within the body or some lymphoid organs within the body, or it can be very uh, structural in nature, forming follicles, so solid spherical bodies tightly packed with lymphatic cells and reticular fibers. And so a lot of different uh, uh, tissues have kind of a combination of these two types uh, of, of arrangement. And we'll see that as we talk about the individual types of, of tissues that are responsible for cleaning your blood throughout the lymphatic system. Uh, lymphoid organs, again, this is, is what we're talking about. These are the things that are made up of those two types of tissues. Uh, you have primary lymphoid organs. Uh, these are where B and T cells uh, mature. And examples of that include the red uh, bone marrow and the thymus. Okay, so red bone marrow and your, your thymus is here. And then you have the secondary lymphoid organs. And this is where most of the action that we're gonna be concerned with is, is happening. So this is where mature lymphocytes, what is a lymphocyte? It's a B or a T cell. These are, are, are this is where you're first gonna encounter an antigen and become activated. 
So what does that mean? This means that uh, this is where mature B or T cells first encounter antigen, so bacteria, viruses, uh, cancer cells, these types of things, and they become activated, okay? Um, and they become activated and then they work with macrophages and, de and dendritic cells to, to get rid of those, those things that you don't want in your blood. And there's a whole bunch of secondary lymphoid organs. Um, there's various lymph nodes throughout your entire body. You have literally hundreds of these. Um, some of them are in the neck, for example. So you might know that when you go to, to the doctor and you say you're not feeling well, often they feel around your neck. Um, and this is to feel for, for swelling of your, your, your lymph nodes. And that's because when, when you're sick, often uh, those lymph nodes are the first ones to kind of swell up a little bit. And sometimes if you're not feeling well, you could actually feel it yourself. Okay? It doesn't necessarily mean there's any sort of disaster. It just means your body's doing what it's supposed to. It's, it's working for you. Okay? But the doctor will, will often check for that. Um, so lymph nodes are an example. The tonsils. Okay? So tonsils within, within your oral cavity. Um, there's various, uh, there's the spleen, and then there's also um, these things called Peyer's patches. These are throughout your, your intestines. And even the appendix here, which people used to think is, is, doesn't really serve a function, this is actually classified as a secondary lymphoid organ. So we'll touch very briefly on each of these. Um, and that's what I just said. We're going to touch uh, briefly uh, on each of these in a little bit more detail. Okay, so first of all, lymph nodes. Uh, two functions of the lymph nodes. Uh, the first of them is to act as, as filters. Okay, so um, uh, macrophages that are within your lymph nodes, these are going to destroy microorganisms. What's a microorganism? Things like bacteria. Um, so the, the idea is that this is going to prevent unwanted things from being delivered back into your blood. Um, it also, again, provides a spot for all those cells to hang out okay, between infections and during infections. And uh, basically it allows your body to mount a response against any sort of an infection that might occur. Okay, so those are the two main functions. Obviously those are, are related as well. Okay, so these are showing the, the location of, of really some of the lymph nodes throughout your body. Again, you, you have hundreds of these throughout your entire body. And again, a lot of them are around the neck and that's what uh, a physician might be um, looking for when she's, she's palpating your neck during an exam. Okay, um, and uh, so these are the lymph nodes. Um, yeah, hundreds of them throughout the body. Um, some of them are, are very close to the surface. Those would be the ones that, that the doctor might feel for. Um, others are, are deeper within your body, okay? Um, so, so these are gonna converge again into larger, larger structures, uh, uh, ducts that eventually empty back into your blood supply. And that occurs again here, this is draining this side of the body, and here, which is draining the rest of the body, um, sorry, I didn't outline that very well, here, is on the left side, and, and that's going to be returned back to the venous system. Um, lymph nodes ha have some structure to them, so they're, they're described as having an, an outer cortex, um, an inner medulla, and sinuses, okay? Uh, so so the, uh, the cortex is this region here, and these are really packed with these lymphoid follicles, okay? Um, then you have this medulla region in here, um, and so what happens is that you're gonna have lymph which is coming into the lymph nodes um, through what are called afferent lymphatic vessels that's going into the, uh, the lymph node, and then efferent is going out of the lymph node. So it's gonna encounter the cortex and then the medulla. Okay, medulla um, is where you have most of these plasma cells and T cells. Um, the cortex has uh, a few T cells, but mostly B cells. And these are really kind of just different arrangements of, of these that allow you to, to properly filter and, and clean your blood of any of these antigens. Again, what is an antigen? It's any foreign body that's, that's in your system. So bacteria, uh, debris, uh, uh, defective cells, cancer cells these would all be classified as antigens. Uh, so this, this is kind of a blow up up here. And so you see that there's really kind of a lot of structure to lymph nodes. Um, and, and these different things are given these different, different uh, names. Uh, you have the uh, medullary sinuses. Again, a sinus really means a space. It's space where these B, T cells, uh, macrophages, etc., where all of these different things can interact with each other. 
You'll see that the mastering AMP assignments actually go into a little bit more detail, and so you'll learn a little bit by doing that assignment. Uh, this entire structure is, is surrounded by a capsule which helps to, ki to uh, keep the lymph node uh, structure and maintain its function over time. Uh, so uh, lymph nodes, uh, like other parts of the lymphatic system, can also uh, become inflamed or infected. Uh, basically, if, if there's too much of an infection and a given lymph node cannot uh, deal with any sort of bacteria or foreign substance, then they can become inflamed and swollen. An example of this is, is uh, actually comes from the bubonic plague. The name bubonic plague comes from these structures called huevos, um, which are inflamed, uh, swollen, or tender lymph nodes. Um, and this is, again, when these guys are overwhelmed by whatever antigen, bacteria, virus, etc., that these guys are, are trying to destroy. Okay, um, And often these uh, are... Uh, uh, will result in a, a swollen gland. Uh, sometimes huevos are, are pus-filled, but again, uh, bubonic plague was named based on this. So a little bit of trivia here, and this tells us that lymph nodes are actually very importantly linked to these concepts of homeostasis. Okay, the next lymphoid organs that we want to talk about is the, is the spleen. Uh, the spleen is uh, considered to be a, uh, a, a blood-rich organ. It's about the size of a fist. It's located in the left side of the abdominal cavity, and we'll see a picture of that on the next slide. Um, and it's served by the splenic artery and vein. Okay, um, There's a variety of functions of the, of the uh, spleen. Uh, first of all, most importantly for, for your immune function, it is uh, uh, the site of lymphocyte proliferation, uh, immune surveillance, and response. Okay, uh, so this is where those B and T cells will begin to proliferate within your body. Uh, the spleen is also important for cleaning your blood. Um, and the major thing that it cleans from your blood is old blood cells. So old blood cells and platelets um, will be removed by the, the spleen. And it also serves as a store of blood cells and platelets as well. Okay, um, and so you have macrophages that are in there and these guys will gobble up any type of old cell or debris break them down, and move on to the next. Um, so this is what your spleen looks like in your body. Um, and so this is the spleen right here. Um, and you'll notice that it, it's under this uh, structure called the, the diaphragm. And as we'll see in the next unit, the diaphragm is actually really important for breathing. But you see that everything's kind of packed really tight in there. Um, and so that this is what uh, tells us the exact position of the spleen. It's right underneath the diaphragm. Okay. Other, other features here, uh, you have the splenic artery, so a very large artery. You have the adrenal gland. This is where that uh, epinephrine and norepinephrine is coming from that we talked about in so many lectures. Um, and then you have the pancreas. Pancrea pancreas we're not going to be talking about in, in this course. Um, so three additional functions of the spleen. Um, I talked about this, uh, I touched on this a bit, I guess. It stores uh, breakdown products of red blood cells, so like iron for, for, for later use, um, and it stores uh, platelets. Um, platelets are, are responsible for what we call clotting. So they contain substances that will promote blood clotting um, when you're injured. Okay, And so that means that it'll, it'll, it'll allow your blood to form a scab, essentially, and, and seal a wound. And there's some thought that it might be um, the site of uh, fetal erythrocyte production. So that means that the production of red blood cells or, or red blood cell precursors uh, in, in the fetus. Okay, so those are three additional functions of the spleen. Again, spleen is the second of these secondary lymphoid organs that we're talking about. The first one was the, the lymph nodes. Um, okay, uh, we can also look inside the spleen and there's, there's different uh, areas to it. So there's uh, the white pulp area. So that would be this area here. This is where you contain most of those lymphocytes and reticular fibers. What's a lymphocyte? Again, lymphocytes, B and T cells. Reticular fibers, that's where they hang out. Um, they interact with macrophages. Um, they interact with dendritic cells. Uh, red pulp is where most of these functions related to red blood cells um, are taking place. So uh, this is where uh, macrophages will engulf old red blood cells and recycle their contents, particularly the iron that is in red blood cells. 
And we'll see in the next unit that the iron in red blood cells is actually really important for uh, the binding of oxygen in those red blood cells. Uh, the spleen is actually something that's pretty delicate. And so uh, if you're injured, a direct blow to it or, or even an infection, uh, the spleen can become damaged and you can get release of blood. So again, it's, it's very rich in blood, red blood cells into the peritoneal cavity. So that just means the body cavity. Um, and so you actually don't need a spleen. It's, it's a good thing, but you, it's not absolutely essential. And so uh, when you have a, a spleen that is injured, it can be removed. Uh, often it was the case in the past that if you had an injury to your spleen, you just removed the whole thing. Um, now it's been discovered that, that really the spleen has a remarkable capacity to, uh, to kind of remake itself, okay? So it can often repair itself. And so, so the, the, the frequency with which a spleen is completely taken out is, it changes dramatically. Uh, another interesting little bit of trivia here is that um, there's something called an accessory spleen. So uh, some people have a second little small organ um, about the size of a quarter, for example, that, that uh, almost serves as, as a secondary spleen site, okay? Um, the next tissue that we're gonna look at, again, number one was the lymph nodes, number two is the spleen, the second one is the malt. Malt stands for mucosal or mucosa-associated lymphoid tissue. And this is basically more diffuse lymphoid organs that are throughout your entire body. And again, the, the point of these is to protect pap you from pathogens that are trying to enter your body. Um, so where are these? These are in areas where those pathogens might be trying to get into your body. So one example is the tonsils. Um, you have the Peyer's patches. These are within the intestinal area and you have the appendix. So we'll just touch briefly on both of those. Um, the tonsils it is really kind of one of the uh, simplest lymphoid organs. Uh, again, you have these around your, your, your oral cavity and your, your uh, larynx. Um, it forms a ring around uh, the pharynx. And uh, you might notice these as kind of a, what looks like a, a swelling or a protrusion. Uh, there's different types of tonsils depending on where they are. Uh, I do not care if you know uh, these different locations. All you have to know is that there's actually different types of tonsils um, that are called different things in different locations. That's really the extent of it, okay? Um, the Peyer's patches. Peyer's patches are these, uh, again, diffuse lymphoid uh, structures uh, supplemented with lymphoid follicles, and these are within the small intestine. Uh, so the small intestine, that's where, where uh, some of your food is going through eventually after your stomach. Um, and so uh, this is a great spot for bacteria to be trying to enter your system. Um, and so uh, these Peyer's patches, this, this uh, more diffuse, um, uh, diffusely structured uh, lymphoid tissue. This is going to destroy bacteria. It's going to prevent them from getting through that intestinal uh, endothelium. Um, they are also responsible for generating what we call memory B or T cells that can fight later infection. So one one rule of your immune function or of your your uh, immune cells B and T cells is to to stave off a response that is happening now. But as we know through things like vaccine, another role of them is to, to fight against future infections as well, okay? Um, okay, uh, another aspect of the malt is this thing called the appendix. I know you guys know what the appendix are. Sometimes people have an infected appendix, appendicitis, and it has to be removed. Uh, often in the past, people thought that the appendix was what was called a vestigial organ, that it didn't really do anything. Now we appreciate it, that it has an important role within the lymphatic system, within this, this uh, providing immunity to your system. Um, and so one thing that it does is it can help to, to uh, destroy bacteria and prevent them from getting into your, your intestine, okay? So the appendix is gonna be right at the beginning of your, your large colon as, um, or your large intestine, right after you come from the ileum of the small intestine. Um, and again, this is going to, to be generating memory lymphocytes as well, okay? Um, and so one other function of the appendix that isn't listed here is, aside from destroying bacteria, one thought is that a certain amount of, of good bacteria within your system can actually help you uh, stay healthy. And it is actually thought that the appendix might serve as a reserve 
of these healthy bacteria. And so if for some reason your system becomes compromised and you lose those healthy bacteria, the appendix has some of those healthy bacteria and these can repopulate the rest of your system and uh, basically help to stave off some of those bacteria that you don't want. So there's kind of this constant war going on between healthy bacteria and bad bacteria. The appendix plays a role in that by providing a spot for the good bacteria and uh, basically preventing the bad bacteria from uh, invading inside of your, your, your intestines. Uh, finally, the well, I think almost finally, we have the thymus. Thymus is a bilobed organ that is found around the neck. Okay, um, so the position is shown here. And uh, really what I want you to know here is this is where lymphoid uh, uh, cells, in particular the T cells, will mature. Um, and so that's really all I want you to know about the thymus. And, and we're not really going to talk about the red, one, red bone marrow. And so um, if we look at this summary table, table 20.1, you have the lymph nodes, spleen, the malt. The malt, uh, had, again, is this kind of diffuse lymphatic tissue in addition to a few follicles. Uh, we said that that includes the appendix. It also includes the pyres patches, also the tonsils as well. Um, these are all secondary organs. Thymus is considered a, um, a primary organ because it's involved in T-cell maturation. The red bone marrow, we didn't go into detail here. This is also a primary lymphoid organ. Um, and uh, this is also involved in kind of the, the genesis of some of these lymphoid cells. Okay, so secondary is organs such as the lymph node, spleen, and the malt. This is where all the action is occurring. The thymus and the red bone, red bone marrow, it's about making the players that are involved in that action. Okay, so that is it for our short lecture related to uh, the lymphatic system. Again, we're really just kind of touching the surface there. Um, I hope you enjoyed it though, because it's actually something that a lot of people don't know too much about. So if you're at all interested in these ideas of immunology, you'll have plenty of opportunities in other classes to learn about the immune functions of the lymphatic system and other aspects of immunology. Uh, as I, I've done before, there's a number of review questions here. And so you can go through these and, and test your knowledge based on what you've just learned. I threw in a few other ones from other lectures as well. In this case, the answers are in the notes section, okay? So you'll have to download the presentation and then you'll be able to see the answers to these questions in the notes section, okay? Um, okay, uh, so the summary today, we were, we were looking at the lymphatic system. Really, there's two roles here. It's a role in returning interstitial fluid and then uh, it also has a role in, infect, in infection control. And really we were just, again, grazing the surface here, learning a little bit about this system that, that most people know nothing about. Um, up next, we're gonna be learning about the respiratory system. Um, so we'll begin that next lecture. Um, and there's four lectures on the respiratory system, and then that will, will essentially conclude the course. Um, and so I'll see you next time for our, our talk on the respiratory system. Uh, there's a YouTube video which you can watch here as a primer. Uh, as always, if you have questions uh, as you're going through the material or in past material, uh, feel free to, to send me an email at any time. Thank you.